there does seem to be a venom, especially over the past few months, to, to the, the groomer label, which I'm sure if you did a LexisNexis search for groomer, you'd find very little and then a huge spike in 2022 and just seeing that term being thrown around. And in a way, it reminds me less of 2003, 2004 than it reminds me of the satanic panic, which I'm sure you remember as well. Welcome to Deep Dive with me, Sean Fettig. I'm a political scientist, and I'm interested in how our governments and our politicians influence our lives, but also how our personal stories influence our politics. In this podcast, I may focus on topics in the news, but this is not punditry. Instead, I dive deep into issues and stories with my guests, behind the headlines, beyond the basic narrative that's often crafted by the media and our politicians, to help us better understand each other and why we think and feel the ways we do. As I've discussed with guests in previous episodes, the Republican Party has thrown all in on an anti-gay, anti-trans platform this year. Republican-led states across the country, most prominently in Florida and Texas, have taken steps to ban books with queer content, ban any discussion of queer topics in schools, criminalize gender-affirming health care for trans youth, and norming cruel language that demonizes queer folks as pedophiles and groomers. In a way, it reminds me of 2003, when the Republican Party was employing some of the same tactics around same-sex marriage, gay folks serving in the military, and gay parents adopting children. But then, the public was perhaps more closely aligned with the Republican Party position on some of these things. Today, the Republican Party's platform seems grossly out of line with popular public opinion. In June of this year, 71% of the U.S. population supported same-sex marriage. About 66% support trans folks serving in the military, and about half of the population believes that it's unacceptable for any adoption agency to discriminate against gay folks. Public opinion does get a bit murkier when people are asked about allowing trans people to participate in sports that do not coincide with their gender as assigned at birth, with 62% in opposition. And none of this accounts for more granular level support by state or district. Nonetheless, It makes me wonder if the Republican Party can find much purchase here. So, today I'm talking to Dr. Paul Brewer, a friend of mine, out of the University of Delaware. He teaches in both the Departments of Communication and Political Science. He's the author of the book Value War, Public Opinion and the Politics of Gay Rights. His research examines public opinion, including how elites influence public opinion of LGBT folks, and how and why that opinion evolves. We talk about the history of queer rights and related public opinion, what we're seeing in public opinion on these issues now, and a bit about what the Republican Party might hope to gain with this anti-gay platform, and if we can predict with any degree of accuracy how successful they might be. Let's do a deep dive. Dr. Brewer, thanks for being here. How are you? I am doing well. Thanks for having me on your podcast. We did a piece of research together, and I guess now it was over 11 years ago um, when I was a grad student. But so since then, I have followed your research, and I I think it's it's so thoughtful, and it's always so relevant and salient. And for clarity, your research is really a focus on public opinion, or at least what we're here to talk about today is a focus on public opinion, how public opinion is shaped, uh, what influences it. And there's a nexus with kind of a big chunk of your research that is focused on queer related. Yes. Given the Republican Party's focus on, you know, queer and trans issues this election cycle, I, I thought it would be it's a good time for me to kind of reconnect with you and pick your brain a bit. Yes, uh, it's it's a topic, LGBT issues in politics and public opinion. You know, it's a topic that kind of comes and goes in terms of its prominence on the public agenda, but it's one that always seems to keep pulling me back in. Mm-hmm. I actually wrote my dissertation about public opinion, about gay and lesbian rights back in the 1990s when it first became, oh, let me back up, uh, gay rights and uh, LGBT topics, they, they've been in the public eye for way back before the 90s in various ways. Mm-hmm. But that was when there was, a, there was some major national policy debates over LGBT issues, like uh, uh, marriage equality, although it wasn't called that back then, mm-hmm. uh, employment non-discrimination, military service. These are all big issues in the 90s. And so I was interested in public opinion about policy issues. And so I did some research 
then uh, the issue got new attention, especially in 2003. And, and in the run up to that, with uh, new political debates over topics like civil unions and then marriage equality. So I did another round of research on it. And then a few years back, uh, with the growing prominence of transgender rights and transgender people and transgender candidates in the public eye, I had a third go around with mm-hmm. LGBT issues. One of the narratives about public opinion on, well, I guess same-sex marriage or marriage equality and, and acceptance of gay folks is that some a, a massive shift occurred in a relatively short period of time in, in a way that doesn't have a really clear corollary in public opinion in other areas. You know, from almost universal disdain in the 80s to almost universal tolerance, if not, I suppose, acceptance now. And if there was a clear moment in history on which we could comparatively examine significant shifts in public opinion for gay folks, a before and after, and I'm not including trans folks here, what might that be? Or or, or does it even exist? And I have have things in my mind that stick out as being kind of clear moments in that timeline, but I'm not sure if that tracks with actual changes in public opinion. I'll be curious to hear your top of the head moments, because if you look at the trends over time, and once you get back to the early 1990s, the the data become fuzzier because people didn't ask, especially on policy related questions, as opposed to, you know, what do you think about uh, LGBT people, or in this particular case, gay and lesbian people. Mm -hmm. But the overall pattern has been one of steadily increasing support for legal protections and civil rights of gay and lesbian people. Now, there have been a few potential bumps along the way in that trend. But as you, as you mentioned, you know, on a lot of issues, like you take, take abortion, which is obviously where we're speaking now, mm-hmm. when there's been a lot of public discussion about a leaked uh, Supreme Court opinion that if it's real or if that's the ultimate outcome would overturn Roe v. Wade, public opinion has had its ups and downs on abortion, but within a fairly narrow range. On the other hand, by gay and lesbian rights, there's been a huge shift, and there aren't too many topics where you can see shifts like this. Uh, Mm -hmm. Civil rights, maybe from the 40s on to the present in some areas, for example, if you look at public acceptance of interracial marriage, that's been a dramatic shift over time. If you look at, more recently, marijuana legalization, that's a pretty dramatic shift, too. But definitely thinking about policy issues, domestic policy issues, social policy issues, where public opinion has changed pretty radically in a generation. Uh, Gay and lesbian rights are definitely one of the most obvious places. I wonder if it's like my own formative experience is, you know, brings certain things to the foreground for me. And that's just, you know, anecdotal. But I think of things like, you know, the murder of Matthew Shepard or, you know, Biden preceding kind of Obama and coming out in favor of same-sex marriage. And then obviously the Supreme Court decision in Obergefell. But I don't know if those actually, you know, correlated with significant bumps in public opinion or if they're just at the forefront of my mind. I think those are topics where events might have had a small impact, maybe a reinforcing impact. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the trends, you don't see huge shifts around any of those there is some evidence that events have shifted public opinion on the topic. For example, there's a study back when Bill Clinton announced his support for allowing military service, mm-hmm. gay and lesbian service members. And there's a big backlash against him for that. And he backed away from the position. But there was a, there was a study that found that his stance cost him public approval, but it did increase support for the policy position that he mm-hmm. initially advocated for. So events do change things, but I think looking at the pattern, it seems it seems to me that there's a broader transformation, social transformation, that in some ways what political leaders have been doing and public policy has been doing has been following that opinion shift as much as it has been driving it. And I think, you know, when I think about those sorts of things, I think a broader popular culture and increasing visibility of gay and lesbian people in society might have some roles to play in explaining that story. Did Obama suffer as a result of coming out in favor of same-sex marriage in any way? He did not in any way. Uh, And I think the difference there is that public opinion had moved a lot. And 
So Obama really, I think it's fair to say that he followed public opinion. Mm -hmm. Maybe he influenced it some, or maybe he followed his vice president in this particular case. Uh, From the early 2000s on into the Obama administration, you have this situation where politicians like John Kerry and Joe Biden and Obama himself did this kind of complicated dance where they say, oh, I'm for civil unions, but you know, I'm not for legal recognition mm-hmm. at the federal level of a, a national right uh, to marriage equality. But I think any reasonable observer could see that that's what they really thought and that they were simply being very careful with their words because they were afraid of some sort of backlash, the kind of which might have actually happened in 2003. I think that's one place where if you look at public opinion trends, like if you look at the Gallup trend, there's actually a decline in support for marriage equality in 2003. That's the year that a Supreme Court decision in Massachusetts legalized uh, same-sex marriage in that state. And so in 2004, uh, George W. Bush ran ostensibly on a platform of state pushback against legal recognition of gay and lesbian marriages, a, a position which he immediately abandoned when he ran re mm-hmm. I might add. Uh, so yeah, to, to get back to your question, I, I don't see any evidence that the Obama-Biden administration suffered any negative political consequences for their shift on that issue. This actually, for me, begs the question, you know, when you mentioned popular culture, and I want to dig a little into that um, in a minute, but I might be mischaracterizing this, so please tell me if I am, but it's it feels like perhaps the public opinion, favorable public opinion, is influenced by popular culture, and it makes me wonder, do political elites on this issue, so LGBT rights, do political elites ever have a positive influence on public opinion? Well, partly depends on what you mean by positive. Do you mean positive and beneficial, or do you mean positive as in... A, a definitive observable. I mean beneficial. Beneficial. Well, if, if you're from the point of view that increasing support for LGBT rights is a beneficial thing for society, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, again, I think on the margins, when political elites take stances, members at least of their own political party will come along to some extent. But if political leaders uh, or ideological leaders, partisan leaders or religious leaders take a stance on the opposite side, then what you can often see is what we call polarized public opinion. And you see this for uh, gay and lesbian rights, you see this for transgender rights, is that there's a growing partisan and ideological gap on these issues where members of the public basically follow the leaders that they trust. And the more people pay attention to politics, the further away their opinions are from people on the other side of the political fence. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the the most dramatic, noticeable impact that political leaders have on issues like this is polarizing public opinion. It feels like in popular culture, there's been this explosion lately of material that, you know, provides some exposure to the voices of trans folks. And, you know, the examples that I, you know, put a list are like Transparent or the TV series, you know, Transparent, We Are Who We Are, Pose, and Euphoria, and there's a, there's a handful of others. But is that translating to a shift in public opinion for trans folks? I think there's some reason to believe that it does, at least, you know, at least on the margins. So going back again to public acceptance of gay and lesbian people and, and civil rights for gay and lesbian people, you know, back in the 90s and onward, there were some pretty high-profile cases of popular culture representations of gay and lesbian people. For example, Ellen Mm -hmm. on her show back before she was a talk show host. Uh, And there was a study arguing that the TV show Will and Grace, you remember that one? Mm -hmm. Uh, So it had a a couple uh, gay characters. And so the authors of this study argued that people form what they call parasocial relationships with characters in popular culture, especially characters that they see over and over again, like an ongoing television series. And they feel that these people, you know, they're people that they relate to and they're they're, their friends and they follow their stories. And if we form parasocial relationships with LGBT people, then that can increase acceptance 
of them in support for their rights, just like interpersonal contact in real life, IRL, can do so as well. And so there's evidence of that in the case of gay and lesbian people. And when back in the mid-2010s, when we did a public opinion survey, if I'm remembering our findings correctly, we found that people who watched more television overall tended to have more favorable attitudes toward transgender people as well. And this was the time period where you're starting to see more representations of trans people in popular entertainment. Something that's always kind of, I don't know, I've rattled around in my brain, which is people can develop their idea of a group of folks via, you know, TV or popular culture or media. And often the representation from Ellen forward, there was a period of time where it was just larger than life characters that are very funny, you know, kind of roll with the punches, fit in very well. And I always felt like there was a, that was translating to an expectation for me that like that was who I had to be as well. And if I didn't live up to that, I worried that then I was doing a disservice to, I suppose, the general public on how they felt about, quote unquote, my people. You know, it's really interesting that you bring that up. So I have a colleague who I've done some research in this area on, and this is something he's been doing on his own, but I've seen him doing his work. I see if this resonates with what you're talking about. So one of the things he's interested in is uh, what's sometimes called the politics of respectability, mm-hmm. where the idea is that for a marginalized group to gain public acceptance and public legal recognition of their rights as well, that there's this game that they have to play where they present their most respectable face to the public, that they conform to the conventions of society. So, you know, like with uh, pride parades, for example, uh, maybe making the, the kink stuff less obvious and public forums being clean cut and you know, I think someone associated with this back in the 90s and he's gone off. Well, I think his his role in the movement has maybe changed over time. Andrew Sullivan, for example, uh, back in the 90s, I remember him arguing that the way to get public recognition and support for gay and lesbian rights was being, quote unquote, virtually normal. And so what Phil, Phil was studying was do attitudes toward LGBT people depend on how they their relationships are presented to the public? And specifically, I think what he did was he did a study about, I think it had to do with adoption, perhaps. Uh, and in one condition of his experiment, there was a polyamorous couple. Uh, and another, it was a, a monogamous couple. And he was testing to see if uh, the imagery and the story around those different kinds of families had any impact on attitudes. And I think maybe some people would be surprised, maybe some people wouldn't, that actually the respectability politics didn't make a difference. Oh, really? I wonder if that has evolved because this in the early movements, at least in the, you know, the 1900s, so we're talking like 1940s and 1950s. And I think that at the time that was called like the homophile movement. Yeah. So you had like the Mattachine Society, et cetera. They were very adamantly advocating for men, especially. But I think this also extended to to lesbians. And that would be like the daughters of Belitis. But they, they were they were advocating for traditional respectable dress, right? That you should men wear, you know, shirts and ties and women wear dresses when they're, you know, in public or protesting to present themselves as respectable. And I wonder if that would have like a muted effect now because of our such a cultural shift over time and that that would have been more perhaps influential in the 1940s than now. Yeah. And then I, I again, going back into history here, I think uh, the movement shifted away from that somewhat right around Stonewall. Mm. Uh, but I still see this debate play out, especially I see it played out on Twitter where people argue back and forth on you know, new puritanism and respectability politics and how much the movement should bend to conventional norms and mm. how it presents itself and what it advocates for. Because I believe there, there's, there's some criticism with the big focus on marriage in the early 2000s that uh, some members of the movement actually 
that was not a major goal. They were more interested in challenging marriage as an institution in the first place rather than buying into it. Mm-hmm. Right. But the in that phase, the sort of respectability politics side won out. I want to shift a little bit and talk about some of your specific research. And there are a few things that you've published recently. So one of the findings of your recent research is that the media that media portrayals can influence public opinion, but that interpersonal contact with individuals or specifically with a trans identified person does not influence public opinion. What do you think is happening here? Well, I think there's a couple of things going on here. And I was actually doing so there's been more recent research since we did that study, and so I'll speak to that as well. Mm-hmm. One possibility is that simply we were wrong in our study. That so you do a public opinion poll and it's it's all probabilistic. And so you can find a relationship or not find a relationship and you can do everything right with your survey and you can never do everything right with your statistics, but one study is never going to give a complete picture of what's going on. Mm-hmm. There are other studies done around the same time, and there have been studies since then, that have found at least an association between uh, saying that you know someone who is transgender and uh, saying that you support transgender rights and that you have favorable attitudes towards transgender people. Interesting, by the way, the, the percentage of people who say that they know a transgender person has increased over time, which... You know, the number of transgender people probably hasn't changed, so it's probably a reflection of increasing visibility of transgender people in society. Uh, so it could simply be that uh, our study was a fluke, or maybe that it was an early on study and not as many people at that time were aware that they knew transgender people in real life. But there's a recent study that just came out this year by a, a group of uh, scholars based at Kansas University that suggests that one thing that might happen over time is as the issue becomes more politicized and becomes more of the focus of political debate, that more interpersonal factors might matter less over time and party cues, you know, what what Democrats and Republicans say about the issue weighs more heavily on people's minds than their personal experiences. Hmm. Well, it could be a combination of a fluky result or a relatively early result, or kind of a a sign of the way that the politicization of transgender rights was going to make partisanship a bigger factor in how people thought about the issue. Well, in in some sense, we can see this playing out in real time, Um, you know, with the Republican Party's platform this year being, it seems like just an an all-in investment on, you know, like anti-trans and anti-gay bills. Yes, it's, it's, it's definitely been an avalanche of attempts on this front. And it really, I'm curious to see if if you get this sort of flashback too. It reminds me a lot of 2003, 2004 mm-hmm. with gay and lesbian issues and how that was just a huge part of the Republican campaign in uh, the 2004 elections. There are two things that are, I think, really confound me maybe. And one is... I guess maybe one is an observation. I, I feel like this was maybe a wedge issue that could pay dividends in 2003, 2004, given the level of public opinion at the time, right, or support for queer community at the time. But, but I also wonder, like, what, what benefit does the Republican Party see? What are they seeing that I'm not seeing where they think this benefits them in some way in a changed world where, you know, the, the public, public opinion is almost universally pretty high for almost all things, you know, queer related. Yeah. Although there's, here's, here's my take on what's going on and where it's going in the long run and why Republican leaders might be doing what they're doing and whether that's going to have a long-term payoff or not. So if you look back to 2003, 2004, we were, you know, kind of at the midpoint of the big public shift on attitudes towards gay and lesbian people and gay and lesbian rights. Mm. And so there's a lot more public ambivalence, but especially on things like marriage and adoption. If you look at 2003, 2004 on topics like employment non-discrimination and military service, the public had already accepted those, at least uh, a clear majority of the public. And those are those were not topics that the Republicans made a big deal about in 2004 because they were they were losers loser issues for them. Instead, they focused on the 
areas of gay and lesbian rights where the public was still pretty ambivalent, uh, especially marriage. Now, what we've seen since then is that public support for marriage equality has continued to increase. And so now it's at about the 70% level. Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen polls from the past half year. I know that in the gay and lesbian community, there's at least some concern that this year with Roe v. Wade being under threat, there might be a broader backlash on social issues. If you look at the draft Alito opinion, there's language in there that at least in theory lays out a legal position for rolling back some major Supreme Court decisions uh, advancing gay and lesbian rights. Mm. So I think that in 2000 or 2001, my read is that the Republicans were really, it was really more about two things. One was mobilizing their supporters, that these were issues that energized a big part of their evangelical base. So they're probably not winning many swing voters in 2004 by opposing marriage equality, but they might be mobilizing some of their most ardent supporters. The other thing then, as now I think is going on, is politicians don't just care about general elections, they care about primaries. Mm -hmm. And the primary electorate is much more polarized and attentive than the general election electorate. And if you look at where Republican primary voters, or for that matter, Democratic primary voters, and they have they have pretty sharp opinion divides on LGBT issues. And anti-trans positions are very popular among Republicans right now. Mm. Not so popular among the general public and certainly not popular among Democratic voters, but that's a in the Republican Party that is a majority stance. There's also a different like vibe, I think, to the the way the Republican Party is talking about this now than they did in 2003, 2004. In 2003, 2004, I think it felt like, yes, you know, the the queer community was under attack. And yet you still had this almost, and I hesitate to say this, but a respectable kind of approach for the Republican Party, which was like, you know, we either, either we support civil union, but not same-sex marriage, or we don't support either, but we still, you know, we still support, you know, your basic existence, right? I, I'm generalizing. And now, though, it seems much more almost insidious and it's, you know, the conversation is much more about folks in the queer community being pedophiles or being groomers. And I think it seems like that just came out of nowhere. And I'm wondering what you think the, what does the party believe it stands to gain? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm of two minds on this. One, I think looking back at 2000 or 2004, it's easy for the haze of time to cover up some of the, some of the real ugliness that yeah. was around. Even back then, you know, you have Rick Santorum comparing right. gay marriage to like bestiality. So, mm -hmm. so that was something that was going on. And you do see that kind of pedophile accusation bleed into public discussions of adoption by gay or lesbian couples, especially gay couples. But yeah, on the other hand, there does seem to be a venom, especially over the past few months to, to the the groomer label, which I'm sure if you did a LexisNexis search for groomer, you'd find very little and then a huge spike in 2022 and just seeing that term being thrown around. And in a way, it reminds me less of 2003, 2004 than it reminds me of the satanic panic, which I'm sure you remember as well, mm -hmm. since I think we're of a similar generation. What was that? Was that like the late 70s, early 80s? That was, I think that was more 80s and maybe even barely into the early 90s. Yeah. Uh, for, for any listeners who don't remember that, uh, there is a uh, what, what sometimes called a moral panic mm -hmm. over the idea that there was widespread uh, satanic ritual abuse that involved uh, sexual abuse and even human sacrifice uh, by Satanists. And, you know, the, the FBI investigated this. There's, there's no evidence whatsoever that this was going on. There was a whole thing. This is a side note, but there was a whole thing about certain musicians as well. I think the Beatles were like, like uh, looped into this. And I remember there was this presentation at our church about, you know, if you played certain records backwards, you could hear these messages that were satanic or the imagery on these albums. And I remember going home and I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, mom, but uh, my mom, yeah, threw out a bunch of records that we had as a result of that. Yeah. I, I grew up as a Dungeons and Dragons playing heavy metal loving 
uh, teenager in rural really? Kentucky. I think I can kind of see that, yeah. Uh, but fortunately, my parents uh, were did not buy into that at all. So I I didn't have my Iron Maiden and Metallica <laughs> set tapes thrown out by by my parents. But yeah, that is, it seems what's going on now with transgender people is, and, and you know, this this has been going on a while with the bathroom anxiety, the idea mm-hmm. that trans people using the the public facilities of the gender with whom they identify as some sort of threat to public safety. And again, a charge that seems completely divorced from any sort of empirical evidence. But yeah, there's there's a I would say a venom in some of these accusations that you know, is pretty striking and think that it's the politicians who are saying this, they 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 think that it's something that's resonating with the audience that they're trying to reach. Uh-huh. Similar to uh, a few months before that, a lot of accusations, and this is still ongoing, about critical race theory. Uh-huh. Well, let's talk about the audience then. So it seems to me that like that pop culture and social media have taken a really active role in introducing and exposing us to folks that we're talking about, but of different cultures, backgrounds, sexualities, gender identities, that it's, to me, it's almost hard to believe that political elites can really act as really forceful shapers of opinion, you know, for the broader population, but it seems that they do. So I guess my question is like, who are these people that are both exposed to, and I guess, accepting of portrayals of specific to trans folks in social media and pop culture, but are also malleable enough to be influenced by negative narratives pushed by, you know, these political elites. Yeah, I guess this is another thing that's changed since 2008, 2004 has been the media landscape, where there are certainly cable, partisan cable news back then, but it's occupied an even more prominent role now. And social media wasn't a thing back then. But I think one thing to keep in mind is a lot of this content on Twitter, on Facebook, that the voice is being amplified and the voices that are driving the conversation are often still the same elites. So that you get your news from Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or True Social instead of watching cable news, but you're seeing a lot of the same content. And it may, you know, some of it is, is extreme. I think there, there are more opportunities for people who are on the ideological fringes, like your Marjorie Taylor Greens and your Ron Roberts and your Paul Gosers uh, to get attention this way. But I think the, you know, Fox News, the, 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 the Fox News environment on the right, and Donald Trump and uh, uh, other Republican leaders, you know, they still have a huge amount of power over the nature of the debate that takes place. And these, this changing media landscape in some ways simply gives them other tools for reaching their audience. After the 20, I guess, 15, 2016 election, you saw this kind of self-reflection on the part of the media in how they presented, you know, the horse race and how they presented information about elections and, and candidacies and a, a reflection on, are we convoluting this message to the public when we focus so much on national level politics and yet so much of like the outcomes in elections really matters at the district and state level? Meaning it's, it's the electoral college isn't, an, you know, national public opinion we hope tracks with the outcome in the electoral college, but it doesn't have to, right? And we've seen that quite a few times in the you know last twenty years. And so there's this kind of self reflection. I guess I'm wondering if the same thing is possibly happening here, where our our sense of how we measure or talk about public opinion as it relates to queer folks, trans folks, you know, does it get convoluted when we look at this or we we try to understand this through the lens of national and kind of public opinion versus by district or by state? It's tricky because I think one uh, another trend that's been going on, uh, but it affects different races and different levels of government differently, is the nationalization of public discourse. So I think you yeah, had these smaller scale, more localized political conversations, but given the media environment, a lot of people are paying attention to the national conversation or the local conversation. Mm-hmm. For example, if you look at Senate, Senate elections, They've been very nationalized. Mm -hmm. So it's very rare for a state political environment to produce a winner in a Senate race that goes against national political trends. Uh, Certainly, you can see exceptions like Joe Manchin, but he's sort of the exception that proves the rule. Whereas on gubernatorial races, the exceptions are much more common. So you have 
are Republican governors of deep blue states like Larry Hogan and Phil Scott. And mm-hmm. you have uh, Democratic governors of deep red states like Andy Beshear, in my home state of Kentucky. Uh, and I realized that you also brought up uh, something that I never commented on, which was the seeming contradictions in some of the popular culture that people are consuming and then some of the political messages that they're getting about LGBT issues. And one of the things that jumps out at me looking at recent public opinion polls is that there's a lot of, especially on transgender issues, there's a lot of ambivalence that people don't necessarily have neat, clean, organized opinions. Mm -hmm. Some people do. Some people are across the board, favorable towards transgender people, supportive of transgender rights, or the opposite. Mm -hmm. But then you have some people who, for example, will say, yeah, uh, trans people should get to choose the gender identity that they have in their public records and documentation, but disagree that trans women are women or that trans men are men, that they can hold both of those opinions, beliefs, ideas in their heads at the same time, or that they oppose bans on students joining teams, sports teams that match their gender identity, but they think that trans people should uh, compete in the sports using the gender that they were assigned to birth with. Mm -hmm. It's logically, some of these opinions don't necessarily line up with each other, but your average citizen doesn't necessarily have completely coherent, consistent opinions. When I read your research or research like yours, and this is probably to some degree due to, you know, my own particular interest in this, but I'm always trying to pick out like, what are the implications for policy or legislation or for electoral politics. And I think that a lot of your research has implications for for candidates and I I guess also for the media and how the media thinks about its framing. You've done research on how folks react to signaling as to a candidate's gender. How does the media frame that? And and then subsequent support for that candidate. You found that when a candidate is identified as transgender, if somebody knows little else about that person, they will one, assume that the candidate is liberal, and two, be less likely to vote for that candidate. That is irrespective of their own party ID, correct? Yes. If I remember correctly, that's what we found. Definitely on the, there is a penalty that we found in our study that all else being equal, people are less likely to vote for a transgender candidate than a cisgender candidate. And people tend to stereotype transgender candidates as being relatively liberal. Essentially, the liberal voters behave this way as well. They assume that a trans candidate is liberal, and they are also less likely to vote for that person. Yes, and that's consistent with more broadly what we know about that voters will use information shortcuts to uh, make assessments of what candidates believe in, and gender identity is one of those cues, among others. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, people do the same with uh, candidate gender. They do the same with candidate race or ethnicity. So, yeah. When media coverage of campaigns, it's like, oh, this candidate would be the first transgender candidate elected uh, for this particular position, that, that's giving voters a cue that they might use to help form their impressions and even their intentions regarding that candidate. Yeah, I know there's some research along the same lines for, yeah, you know, for female candidates and also for candidates with names that sound un-European or, I suppose, un-white, if all somebody has in the voting booth is a name. And it doesn't have any other identifier, like an R or a D or an I after it, that people assume these candidates are liberal. Yes. And so if, you know, for a presidential race, that doesn't really matter because everyone's going to know a lot about right, the candidate. Right. But there are lots of elections where people, you know, a lot of local races, there's not a lot of coverage. For example, I live in Delaware. There aren't even, there's not local news on television covering these races. There's, you know, a few newspapers that, you know, we know what's happened to the newspaper industry over the last couple of decades. It's, it's, its reach and its financing have been slashed quite a bit. So, you know, in, in, some, in many races, there's uh, not a very rich information environment for voters who are trying to figure out uh, how to cast their ballots. I know of research about how people perceive these candidates when they have these cues without, you know, any other supportive or, you know, verifying information. But I don't know of any that takes that step that you did, which is to then determine if people are less likely to vote for them as a result, kind of irrespective of their party ID. Do you know of any? 
you know, in an earlier study, we had asked people what they would do. And I think what they said they would do lined up with what we observed that they did in our experiment. But I don't know how much research there actually is out there yet on public responses to transgender candidates, which I think it's a topic that warrants more research because we are seeing more candidates for office who are openly trans. Uh, There is a state legislator in Delaware uh, who became Delaware's first member of the state legislature uh, who's openly trans, uh, Sarah McBride. So, and other states have had trans candidates run and win as well. So this is this is definitely something that's a real world phenomenon that's worth studying. And I don't know if this sounds like a ridiculous question, but you know, Caitlyn Jenner. So, you know, as to the point that um, people assume that a trans candidate is liberal, to the best of your knowledge, are they generally correct? Uh, you know, I don't have the numbers. I was wondering about that, but I strongly suspect that. That is correct, because partly of the primary process that Democratic voters are more accepting of trans people, and so a trans candidate is going to have better odds getting a Democratic nomination. So that process is going to tend to produce nominees who are more likely to be Democrats when they're trans than Republicans when they're trans. And Caitlyn Jenner is an obvious exception, uh, but uh, you know I think that might say as much about celebrity politics in the Republican Party as it does about transgender candidates in the Republican Party. So this to me seems like a, you know, for, for reasons we've talked about, a particularly important time to be doing the kind of research that you've done in this area. How do you, how do you iterate on that? How are you iterating on that? Or what are you working on? So I don't have any research projects in the works. Uh, some of the people I've done research with recently, uh, I mentioned Phil Jones, and he's been doing some research with Amy Becker. Mm-hmm. And, and then this Kansas group, which includes people like Andrew Flores and Donald Hayden Markle and Dan Lewis. Uh, They've been doing really great research that I was glancing over before we talked. Mm -hmm. So I've been following the politics of the issue quite a bit and trying to figure out where it goes. Thinking about the short term, you know, I think there might have been a short term backlash in 2003, 2004 on topics like marriage equality. And I think we might be in a potential backlash phase right now with transgender rights. If you look at the polls, on the one hand, there is increasingly favorable attitudes towards transgender people over time, at least up through 2021. On legal protections and legal rights, there's public opinion has been more static, up and down, on topics ranging from restroom access to sports competition. And there's also a lot of variation across different topics in public opinion. But so in the short term, I don't know if support for trans rights is going to go up. But when I was doing research on gay and lesbian rights back in the early 2000s, one thing that really stuck out to me at the time was the huge generational gaps in support for gay and lesbian rights. And so even in the early 2000s, you could look at those generational divides and say, unless something changes, uh, the advocates of LGBT rights are going to win on these issues in the long run. And you see that same divide on attitudes toward trans people and support for trans rights and interpersonal contact with trans people, uh, that younger people are much more likely to say than they're trans people, much more likely to have favorable views towards trans people and trans rights. And if that trend does not change, then I would expect the long-term outcome of the course of public opinion on trans rights to follow the same trajectory as it did with gay and lesbian rights. Mm-hmm. I had a conversation with um, the uh, another friend of mine, the uh, executive director of Out Boulder County in Boulder, Colorado, and she was talking about how they've been receiving a lot of calls from parents and folks in like Florida and Texas asking about, you know, moves to Colorado or making that transition and what type of supports are available, given kind of some of the legislation and the the policies that are coming out of Florida and Texas now. And she she just made, she made this comment that's kind of resonated with me. And and I'm wondering what your thoughts are. And that is, she said, she understands, especially as it relates to like physical safety for some folks at the same time, she's, you know, wondering if everybody leaves these states, who's left in these states, and then what 
what does policy look like in Florida if all of the you know moderating factors have left and is you know if you are in support of queer rights or trans rights at the end of the day are we doing ourselves any favor by leaving these more you know, challenging states i'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that yeah I, this this is something that i think about and also to amend my earlier comments you know i don't necessarily want to present time as this unidirectional arrow mm-hmm. and and say that it's inevitable that support for trans rights is going to win in the end if you look at issues like democratic backsliding you can see countries where rights get taken away. And if you look at uh, the topic of abortion, you might see a, a legal right that's been around for half a century disappear in places, as or it already is in some places. So, And even if there is a long-term pattern, that is probably not a very big comfort to parents of trans children and trans children themselves in a state like Alabama, where there's a ban on gender-affirming care. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I kind of am skeptical that there's going to be huge scale population shifts on topics like this. I think what you see more is sort of broader ideological and lifestyle sorting where big cities and areas like that are getting more and more sorted towards Democrats, liberals, social tolerant people. Mm-hmm. And so if you look at a state like Florida, you know, you've got you know, you got big cities like Miami and Orlando that might be pockets of liberalism within a state that might be redder on the periphery. Uh, so certainly you do see some geographical sorting of people, but I suspect that a lot of families simply don't have the resources to up and leave their jobs and their homes uh, and are facing some really difficult decisions about care versus feeling like they're in a safe environment. Mm-hmm. I think if people had more resources, maybe they would move. But I'm not sure that the scenario being described there is is something that's ever going to be as dramatic and neat a sort as, as that sort of storyline might make it out to be. Right. All right. I've got one final question for you. And it's an easy one. What have you been watching, reading, listening to, or doing lately that has been particularly interesting to you? And it doesn't have to be related to this topic. Okay, so I'll mention one thing I'm really into is genre fiction and uh, stuff like horror and fantasy and science fiction. Mm -hmm. And the topics that we're talking about have really sort of spilled over into that area. So um, I just finished reading a novel last night called Harrow the Ninth, which is uh, the second part of a cross genre series called the Lock Tomb series. And I think the tagline uh, for the first book is uh, lesbian necromancers in space <laughs> investigating a uh, haunted house. And so, yeah. And so uh, there's an increasing representation of LGBT people in genre fiction. And then there's been backlash and pushback against that by people who are, are less welcoming of that. And then of course, in the world of middle grade fantasy fiction, one of the most prominent anti-trans voices of recent years has been someone who was famous 10 years ago for being politically liberal. And I think you probably know who I'm talking about there. That would be the author of the Harry Potter series. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I read that series to my older kid in a couple of weeks after we finished the, the seventh book. She kind of publicly came out as what you'd call a turf. Mm-hmm. That, that's a term that uh, stands for trans exclusionary radical feminist. And so it's kind of fighting words in the political debate between supporters of trans rights and uh, folks who call themselves gender critical. Does that change how you, I mean, this is, this is a whole other topic for a whole other day, but does that change how you approach you know, the idea of reading those books or reading them to your children in the future or, you know, recommending those books. It does. Yeah. It, it, it does for me. Yeah. I grew up on Michael Jackson and have really wrestled with that in the last couple of years. I mean, it's not like I'm, you know, still, you know, diving into that catalog, but. Yeah. And yeah, th- that's a case where whatever he did, he's, he's no longer alive. 
And, you know, if you buy his music, I guess you're supporting his estate. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's not actively advocating anything right now. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, a living author who's using their platform to uh, take political positions, and if you buy their works, then you're supporting them financially. That for me, that seems a little different, but everyone's got to you know draw draw that those lines mm. a little differently and, and where they're comfortable. But yeah, to come back to your original question, it, it does make a difference for me. All right, Dr. Brewer, thank you. I really appreciated this conversation. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Next week, I'm talking to Dr. Nick Davis, the author of the book, Democracy's Meanings, How the Public Understands Democracies and Why It Matters, about how we as Americans can't agree on a definition of democracy, how that creates a schism in what we expect from our government, how it threatens the ways in which we conduct elections, and what that all means for the future of democracy in America, regardless of how you define it. As always, feel free to email me with any questions or thoughts at deepdivewithshawn at gmail.com. And follow the show on Instagram at deepdivewithshawn and Twitter at deepdivesean. And you know, if you have friends that might like the show, feel free to spread the word. Chat soon, folks. <laughs>